October in Linden, Germany. In 1932, Adolf Eichmann would join the Nazi party and in the subsequent years leading up to the Second World War would find himself promoted through the officers of the Schutzstaffel. Eichmann was eventually placed in charge of the deportation of Jewish prisoners to concentration camps, a job which he did with vile efficiency and which would eventually lead to his prosecution as a war criminal more than 15 years after the war ended. Hannah Arendt, a German Jew, was arrested and imprisoned by the Nazi party in a concentration camp called Camp Goers in 1940, but would survive and eventually flee to America in 1941, where she would witness the rest of the war and write about it from afar. In 1962, unbeknownst to Eichmann, these two figures would cross paths in a courtroom in Jerusalem during a trial that would inspire Arendt to deconstruct the paradigm of Western moral theatrics. She witnessed Adolf Eichmann, sealed inside a glass cage like a dangerous beast in the courtroom, attempt to absolve himself of the responsibility of his crimes as a high-ranking officer of the SS. All accusations put forth to him were true. He willingly and knowingly performed the task of organizing millions of Jewish prisoners to be transported to concentration camps. And yet, he claimed himself to be a Zionist. Honest. He said he initially resisted the extermination of the Jews. When he was taken to a concentration camp and showed what his work was enabling, he felt sick to his stomach, and his job was never to directly kill or harm anyone, and that he merely did as he was told by his department. All of these claims are also true, but nevertheless there were no defense to his crimes, especially crimes of such magnitude. Hannah Arendt returned to America and wrote a series of highly controversial and frequently misinterpreted articles published in The New Yorker later in the year in which she said that Adolf Eichmann was not the monster that the world was claiming him to be. She did this not to devalue the evils that the man committed, but to draw attention to the fallacy and the assumption that the evildoer is an inhuman other, separate from good, ordinary people. Eichmann possessed no hatred, no malice, not even a motive based on some twisted satanic logic. What Eichmann had was a startling willingness to conform, a desire to obey, and an inability to think. Arendt argued that without Eichmann, Eichmann and people like him who simply followed the directive set forth by the Nazi leaders, the Nazi party, and by extension the atrocities that were committed in the Second World War, simply would never have reached the scale of impact that they did. Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil by Hannah Arendt is an incredible detailing of her recount of Eichmann's career as a member of the SS. The accusations and witness accounts put forth at the trials and, most crucially, the examination of Eichmann's character as an utterly ordinary man man who contributed vital work to one of history's worst mass murders. Hannah Arendt shows that the pervasive and prominent paradigm of how we perceive ethics in the Western world is utterly limiting and filled with blind spots. Not every evil deed is committed by a monster, and in trying to paint the Eichmanns of the world as monsters, we forgo our ability to examine the morality of ourselves, the people we give power to, and the systems that we become compliant in. The narratives of Western mythology paint good and evil as gigantic spectacles. The greatest goods of the world are those that everyone can celebrate, that have monuments dedicated to them, books and songs written about them. They are extraordinary good things, great things, grand things. They are performed by gods, angels, messiahs, and champions. And, similarly, the greatest evils of the world are those that are the most violent, most bloody, things that everyone can point to in scorn. They are performed by devils, demons, monsters, mad, violent people or so the narrative goes. When the name Adolf Eichmann entered the news after his recapture and subsequent trial in 1962, the overwhelming majority of people called him a madman and a monster, because that's what the narrative calls those who have committed staggering crimes against humanity. Hannah Arendt contested the idea that Eichmann was a monster not out of sympathy for the man or to absolve him of his crimes, but simply because he was outrageously stupid. His beliefs and thoughts on duty and morality were some half-baked philosophy amateurishly plucked out of a misunderstanding of the categorical imperatives of Immanuel Kant, and he never ceased to speak in the clichés and popular tropes of mid-20th century Germany. His defense was embellished with bureaucratic rhetoric that he had picked up just by doing his job, and despite recognizing that he had indeed caused great suffering, he was insistent that the suffering needed to happen simply because he had a duty to his career, his office, and his country. In short, 
He was completely ordinary. He was a silly, job-focused, mistake-making, ordinary man who was just doing a job that needed to be done. And it only so happens that the job that needed to be done, in the mind of Eichmann at least, was organizing the mass transportation of innocent people to their deaths. And that is antithetical to how we in the Western world think about evil. Evil shouldn't be ordinary, but in our denial that it can be, we risk becoming compliant in the morally repugnant things that people can do when and they stop thinking. Most people today, if you ask them what they would have done had they been alive in Nazi Germany, say that they never would have joined the Nazis, never complied, never surrendered the Jewish people to the concentration camps. But people today have the benefit of 2020 hindsight. We know, firstly, that the Nazis were terrible people who attempted genocide, and secondly, that they lost. We've been informed by our culture that the Nazis were undeniably evil, and they were. But would our minds be so bulletproof proof against the Nazis if our culture did not so fervently remind us that they were evil. The question is not posed with the intention of absolving the Nazis of their image as callous mass murderers. By all rights, they deserve to be seen as an undeniable evil. But the question is important to consider because in Germany in the 1930s and 40s, the Nazis didn't have that reputation because the reputation follows the act. At the time, the danger of compliance in Germany existed and was prevalent. So how do we know today that we are not compliant in the evil? evils of the world if we don't stop to think about it. Any one of us could find ourselves in a job or position of power that irrevocably damages the lives and livelihoods of human beings and simply fail to think long enough to consider that we shouldn't be doing it. Hannah Arendt's book is a philosophically marvelous detailing of the morally reprehensible consequences that can accompany compliance. And if you have ever thought seriously about ethics or history and haven't sought this book out yet, then you will find it a fascinating read. I give this book an enthusiastic recommendation to everyone.